Hey, Q, hello? 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 Yes, hello. Yes, uh, hello, Dr. Didi, how are you? Thank you, how are you? Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning to you all. I hope uh, you are doing well. Yes, we are. Oh, Chief Leno, can, can you, you hear me? There? I think uh, you, you may. You, Yes, I can hear you. I think you you can now take over. You, you have to 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 set the ball rolling here. Yeah. I see some people are still to join now. Huh? Okay. Uh -huh. Um. So I can see Doctor Sabiriri. Hello, Doctor Sabiriri. How are you? Good. Thank you. How are you? Yes, and uh, Marco Shoko. Do we have uh, Dr. Charasika here? Yes, I can see something. Hi, Doc. Charasika. Good morning, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? Clear. Loud and clear. Nice. Uh, we we are also waiting. We are actually waiting for Doctor uh, Mahomba to join us. We confirmed that she will be with us. Uh, four minutes so that she can join us, and then we can. Yeah, they, they spoke about so, yeah, 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 you know, um, Hello, Dr. Mahova, how are you? Good morning and hello. Oh, we are so thrilled that you are part of us. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. We were about to start. It's a pleasure. Yes. It's a pleasure. It's, it's not every day that we... we, 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 we it is not in China. They say it is not in headquarters. <laughs> you are the headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So I think we will get the ball rolling. Um, okay. Yeah, you can say that again. It seems that there's someone who's got some background noise. I'm not sure where it's coming from. <laughs> yeah. Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, which is very critical at this time. Um, the Media Center, I would like to invite you all to this uh, particular webinar on the topic yeah. COVID-19 vaccine, dawn of a post-COVID-19 era or the beginning of new programs or new problems, sorry. My name is Lennox Ntlanga. I'll be your facilitator and hopefully we'll have more people joining in as we proceed. Um, we are 
happy to have such an esteemed panel and we'll also like to announce that uh, this uh, webinar is also being um, on Facebook. So we have a much wider audience uh, that is uh, watching us or following us on, on, on Facebook. We will start perhaps by looking at you know, how we went to this webinar. We start with our key speakers, and we've got four panelists, and we'll be introducing them. Come, and then, then we will have what we we'll call a plenary or a session where we will allow the questions that um, are coming from various platforms to be tackled. And this is also a very important aspect, and that we need to have a conversation over over this important topic of COVID nineteen. We are uh, being hosted by the Media Center, and we are represented here by uh, Ernest Zengi. I notice that his uh, mic is muted because we would like him to give us a few remarks before we, we proceed. Um, Tino, you are over there. Ernest Zengi, can you please um, open the session for us and give us context? The mic is yours. Okay, so thank you, Lenox. Uh, basically, this is a discussion on the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, we, as media center, we are a people who facilitate access to information. We also facilitate freedom of expression. So we are doing this as a way of making sure that people have access to information. As you can see, our audience here is the, the, our, our panel represents a cross-section of uh, actors. We have healthy here. we have media people, and the audience. And so it's about facilitating access to information about the vaccine and also raising certain issues uh, that people may, may, may have in mind pertaining to the vaccine and the also, we want to look at a situation where some have opted not to be vaccinated. What are their choices? They are not going to be exposed to segregation and so on and so forth. So basically, this is about information. This is about uh, people's concerns being addressed. I'm happy that we have Dr. Mahomva here from, from, from government. I'm also happy that we have uh, Dr. Jirisaka, Giris, Dr. who is also here and uh, Dr. Mbiriri, who will help us from the point of view of, of lifestyle issues, and so on and so forth. So I think I end it back to the end of Thank you, Ernest. Um, we, we won't waste anyone's time. We will proceed to our first presentation, which will be made by um, Dr. Agnes Maomba. Dr. Agnes Maumba is the Chief Coordinator, uh, National Response COVID-19 Pandemic in the Office of the President and Cabinet. And we are honored to have you on this platform. Uh, Dr. Mahomva, um, we, we, we basically have uh, uh, budgeted uh, two hours for this uh, presentation. So uh, we will give you initially 15 minutes and I'm quite sure that there will be more time for you to expand. <laughs> I don't know if it means is a tall order, but uh, I'm sure with what you have experienced, and, um, you know, um, being someone who's been at that high office, uh, 15 minutes is a walk in a park. So over to you, Dr. Agnes Mahomva. Oh, he's muted. Okay. Uh, my apologies. My apologies. Oh, I was muted. okay. Uh, I, I thought I should have asked you earlier how how long I had so that I would prepare <laughs> appropriately. 
But I chose not to ask you because I thought I just still need to give you some things that mm -hmm. I want to give you. Uh, in exactly. addition to what you want to hear, I think many yeah. times we have questions uh, because yeah. we have focused on a specific area that you want to hear and forget mm -hmm. about the other areas. Yeah. So I hope I can share my slides with many that's of them, but I'm really to make sure that when we do go into the question answer session, I can bring them back up and we can we are able to see the data or the, the, the issues that I will be actually speaking to. So yes. let me see if I can, I hope you, you can allow me to share my screen. A host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that is not going to happen. So that's your disadvantage. Hello? Hello? Your screen, I think. It says screen sharing. Okay. Um, I think Tino will work on that. Um, um yeah i can continue but i think it's usually really important for you to see some of these things it looks it looks like you wanted me to behave like a politician talk <laughs> from a speech and i know actually <laughs> and uh, not be very <laughs> uh, our host was informed that some of our presentations will actually be we will have to be screened. So I'm sure he is working on that. Um, uh, Mahomba screen. Allow me yes, to share. There we are. No. <laughs> Allow me to share host the host disabled. What what does that mean? <laughs> oh. Host disabled participant screen sharing. I still get that uh okay. Maybe. I think he's is work, is working on is working on something. I'm, I'm seeing his screen, what? I think. It's his screen, yes. He should actually be enabling you instead. I just give us some. Um... Thank you. Allah, yeah, I'm informed that uh, Dr. Mahomba, now you are in a position to share the screen. You you may want to try to share. You can uh, tell me if you see it. Yeah, yes, we can see it. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you much. Because I do know it's really the discussions that really make good sense. But without this quick background, we might find ourselves, uh, you know, answered appropriately. So I 
was to really, first of all, give you a, a, the COVID-19 pandemic situation, a quick a overview, a topical, and everybody so very much. As I said, that brief overview, just looking at the numbers that is built, I think that context is so critical. Many of the questions that are coming regionally, globally, you name it. And quite clearly, we have not been spared a smaller country as we are. Uh, our numbers by the end of yesterday, 6,289 cumulative recovery, 33, uh, and of course, very concerned about the deaths, 1,487. Looks like a small number when you compare to other numbers elsewhere, but we're very concerned with the case fatality rate that remains at 4.1. That's quite high, uh, among the highest in the region and indeed elsewhere. So we're, we're not happy with that one, but we're looking to see what's happening. I want to remind you that when we started, the, you, the media, were asking us, is Zimbabwe thumb sucking? What is guiding us? We don't have a plan. We don't have a plan. We had a plan. We specifically put in place a national preparedness and response plan right at the very beginning, right at the very beginning, before we even had the first case. And the goal of our plan is the adverse of the nine impact includes health, economy, you name it, but we were specifically strategic and say we want to focus on the morbidity and mortality. If those number up, people are dying, the economy is talking about. Uh, it included the prevention, containment, and mitigation strategies that we have continued to sing about, and it was very much science-based guide the eight strategies uh, that WHO has also as contact tracing surveillance, testing, and I remember way back then you were saying, we're not testing enough. We had clear strategies for that case management. If you did get it, what is it that was going to happen to you? Are you managing hospital? Are you managing home? Um, infection prevention control, the risk communication, we're here. I introduced seven confirmed laboratories, including uh, private ones. Uh, we, we actually further expanded that from the national to the district, every single district, 52 of them. And now, as we're speaking, they all do testing for COVID-19. Case management, I mentioned it earlier, we had our ministers going around, teams on the ground, ministry of making sure there were facilities for isolation. Initially, it was just the stasis, and I remember you, the media, holding us accountable. Why is it just central? We went on to uh, do to put additional isolation facilities in every single uh, provincial uh, province and uh, district, if you like. So we once again release, and also in line with government ability over the uh, citizen and its strategy and thrust toward the self-efficiency, uh, importing. Uh, substitution, rather, uh, the national response actually also builds capacity for local production of COVID-19 commodities. You are aware the local universities uh, set up units producing PPE, sanitizer, pharmaceutical companies uh, stepped up in terms of production of those medicines that we use to manage uh, the COVID-19, whether it's the paracetamol for your temperatures, the antibiotics, you name it. And of course, the small to medium scale enterprises receive support to produce reusable face masks and so on. So once again, not just the whole of government, but also capacity building our own. So when we do all that, the first wave, as you can see, was now compared with the second wave. In fact, we managed it very well, numbers went down, and everybody started thinking right there, well, this is just a cold flu. There's nothing to worry about. After all, we're not getting into summer. Really nothing to happen will happen to us. And so when we are pushing the message, and thanks to your help as well, pushing the message, please remain focused, please stay away from crowds and so on, nobody was listening. Nobody was listening. The complacency was just unbelievable. But seeing our numbers going up, 
people the media have asked me several times, uh, did you hear this? Were you aware of what we expected? The based on our behavior here, we just knew all oh, we are trouble and we did the trouble got us and the numbers started shooting up. And when we saw the media shooting up uh, it, um, around um, festive season, as we're going into the new year, we realized, whoops, let's really tighten up, put in another lockdown exactly what happened um, the president announced that and of course we worked flat out search specific um, uh, strategies activities we ran around with them but in addition to that we continued pushing that first prevention front uh, that i talked about from our original plan the eight pillars of surveillance in unit a uh, social um social measures in terms of making sure that you continue with your mask and so on and so on that's what we're calling the first prevention front and it remains the rock to our response and we just need to hold that. But in addition to that, this is where we, we realize let's really run with it. Well, we want to use vaccines. It was in our original strategic plan, uh, preparedness and response plan. We realized we needed to actually move faster, faster than what we were thinking initially. And hence, you saw us introducing the second prevention front, uh, that is the de uh, vaccine deployment. And that's what you really want to hear today. But I just wanted to give you that background to make sure we're on the same page. So the government went on to say, okay, through cabinet, as you saw the structure that I showed you, uh, in the meeting of the 9th of February, the intention for introducing the vaccine is to reach 60 uh, percent, at least 60 percent of the population. And of course, the choice of vaccine, uh, according to that statement, then was to really be based on science uh, with adequate research and findings guiding the decision making of that. And of course, to prioritize healthcare workers, we're very aware in our numbers, we had seen so many healthcare care workers uh, uh, contracting the disease and it really compromised how we were going to then help everybody else. So that was really critical. The vaccine, of course, was to be sourced from multiple manufacturers. Everybody has cried out, why Sinopharm? Why don't you get this other vaccine? Cabinet was very, very clear. We are sourcing from multiple manufacturers, but it has got to be based on science. So the broad objective of uh, our COVID-19 uh, plan is to enable high quality vaccination services, reduce morbidity and mortality, Look how it's linking to our very original um, our goal of our preparedness and response plan. We said we want to really um, uh, to counter the adverse effects of COVID-19, but we focus on mobility and mortality. And this is what this vaccine is actually contributing to. The National Deployment and Vaccination Rollout Plan provides a framework for develop uh, for a deployment rather um, implementation, monitoring of COVID. 19 vaccines uh, and ensuring, I want to emphasize ensuring that plan and the related financing are well aligned to the Zimbabwe COVID-19 preparedness and response plan, as I've mentioned, that implementation is fully, fully integrated and we talk of just in Structure already for us is the expanded program on immunization. Everybody knows, as we're speaking now, there are nurses out there vaccinating on measles, on um, uh, polio, and so on. Those structures are robust. Uh, WHO has continuously singled out Zimbabwe for a very, very good uh, immunization program. There's no need for us to reinvent the wheel. We have. We got a bit concerned, surprised when some were being quoted in media saying, oh, experts have told us that healthcare workers haven't even been trained. So how are they going to roll the vaccine out? And we're saying that expert perhaps is not an expert because quite clearly they don't seem to appreciate or know that we already have immunization teams well-trained on the ground doing vaccinations as we were preparing for this vaccine. So people were already trained. What was simply left in vaccine, which does not take a, a long time at all. So this is where we were. And of course, uh, 
strategic uh, plan. Uh, once again, being very strategic, we looked at specific areas, pillars or strategic areas that needed to be covered. And there are 12 key strategic areas that we're looking at with our vaccination. And this slide here is showing you that that context has got to be there. We were very clear. We're not reinventing the wheel. We've got to use systems that are in place. We need to know our numbers. We need to know who is more vulnerable in order for us to really move forward with this rollout. Regulatory preparedness, I will give a little detail on that. Planning coordination of the vaccine introduction, I've already said it. No need to reinvent the wheel. We must use systems that are there. They just need to be strengthened. And we move on with our resources and funding. I'll touch on that little bit in detail because everybody's asking questions about that. The target populations and actual vaccination approaches or the delivery itself. I'll touch on that a little bit. And of course, supply chain management. I don't want to bore you with the details of that. It's really cool cold chain systems, you name it, already in place, just us riding on them, strengthening them, human resource management, including the training of just that seriously. We paid attention to that because there is no way we would want to introduce a vaccine that has got so many side effects to the point where it's, it's, it's not useful for you and so on. And of course, the general uh, monitoring system, I won't dwell on that because as I said, we have a robust uh, Zimbabwe expanded program in immunization working well to ride on that one. Covalence, 19 uh, vaccination surveillance is again riding on what, what we do with other vaccinations, but ensuring that any peculiarities to the COVID-19 vaccine are included. And of course, finally, finally, we took it upon ourselves to say our deployment rollout plan has got to say at the end of it all, when it's said and done, have we evaluated the whole process? Because next year, the year uh, following, we might actually have another uh, pandemic. And we need to learn lessons and say, we have evaluated. These are the issues that came out. As we move forward, we are ready and prepared for anything else that might come our way. So this is really the summary of our deployment, uh, the vaccine deployment uh, rollout plan. So if I may give a little bit of detail in areas that have that I have really been continuously asked about, questions keep coming up. The COVID-19 vaccines to be registered by the Medicines Control Authority of Zimbabwe. I, in my updates, I have said it several times in my past two or three updates have really just been on uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccination and so on. And this is really under the emergency use authorization. We say emergency use authorization uh, uh, because there is no COVID-19 vaccine that was there before this disease came on. So you will know the vaccine that is always waiting there and people get concerned. Why is, are we using it in emergency? Are we experimenting? No. We are looking at the science that has just come out. And because this is an emergency, we have to move as fast as we can to protect our, our, our population, to protect you and I. And that's exactly what is happening globally. It's not just about Zimbabwe. The secret is using our science. And science is not about global science. It's about global science, yes, plus the local science, that local context. What are our numbers telling us? What is it that we need to do to adjust? Not to just say if the world says you must vaccinate over 80 percent for herd immunity then you say yes let's also do the same in zimbabwe have you also looked at your data have we looked at our data to then be say what percentage do we need to do and not just to take uh, cut blanche what is coming from elsewhere. And of course, the Ministry of Health and Child Care has set up and is implementing a safety monitoring plan to enable swift detection of those adverse if events if and when they do occur. So if I move on to resource funding, which is another area, people say, oh, you have just received COVID-19 uh, sign -off from China. Uh, are we going to be able to vaccinate the percentage you're talking about? Uh, why are we just 
depending on donors, not at all, not at all. We're very strategic. This is part of that strategic area in our rollout plan. Treasury has set aside 100 million US uh, dollars for procurement of the vaccines, 7 million for the actual operational costs that we're incurring. And of course, the many well wishers are including the private sector. The private sector, I remember we met with them uh, at State House uh, with His Excellency uh, Treasury outlining what we were expecting, what we really need to move on, uh, making sure that we're wrapping them in, but at the same time, making sure that uh, the, that coordination is very clear. Other nations, as I have just pointed out, China, uh, and so on and so on. We are very strategic, we're not narrow-minded. And so but this is the summary of that, uh, uh, the resource mobilization, what we are actually using. Once again, to emphasize, it is the government of Zimbabwe that is leading this process. It is not about a donation. We have procured 600,000 doses of Sinopharm vaccine. And by the way, Sinopharm vaccine, it did go through the regulatory processes. We demanded, we requested, we got all the paperwork from the clinical trials, phase one, phase two, you name it, from the manufacturer. Our medicine control authority went through it and they then issued the uh, emergency use authorization with the evidence and so on. And of course, China has given uh, donated 200,000. That's what we use now. They went on to donate another 200,000 of the same uh, vaccine, Sinopharm. Other countries that have come on board, you heard last week with the VP, who is the Minister of Health and Child Care, talking about the India donation of 75,000 doses of co-vaccine. Uh, once again, by the time he was announcing it on the fourth, uh, we, the Medicines Control Authority had already done its work, had re requested for all the paperwork, there were a bit of delay here and there, and we were saying, we're not moving until we get all the, the science and the paperwork. And of course, on the third, they, they cleared it, they got it, they issued that uh, emergency use authorization with the evidence, with the science, and of course, the VP went on to announce it to you. Russia has also placed donation of 20,000 doses of Sputnik V vaccine. Again, when uh, the, the process I'm talking about, the regulatory processes, making sure uh, we are very clear that the science has been followed that this is a safe vaccine for us goes through. UK at the very beginning also offered to give us some donations, but I think theirs is very much linked to the WHO Gavi COVAX facility donation. And uh, on that one, we find everybody was very concerned. Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Go on. Hello, we seem to have lost. Uh, yes, doctor. yes, we Dr. have lost. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. We will try to get yes, yes. Uh, back. Oh, yes, I think, yeah, yeah, we have lost. Maybe we may be we may go get to other steps. It seems that we have lost our our keynote our, our keynote speaker. Uh, I think what we'll do to manage this whilst we get her back on board. She will join us later. Uh, we will ask Dr. Charasika to uh, come on board. Uh, Dr. Charasika, can you be ready to take over so that we manage this uh, uh, mini crisis that we are having where we have lost our keynote speaker? Uh, Dr. Charasika. Yes, um, thank you very much. Oh, she's. Oh, is she back? Hello. Hello. 
Yes, okay, she's back. back. Don't come home, but yes, yeah. look like she's back. Yeah. Okay. We had lost you there, doctor. Cut off. Yes. I got cut off now. I'm wondering whether it's running on without you hearing me. I'm not sure where, where we were now. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen again. Hmm. Very interesting. Is that where I was now? I don't even remember. Uh, uh, yes, okay. I hope I hope at some point you are not speaking to yourself. I, I don't know. You, you're going to tell me where I was, uh, okay. then I can continue. <laughs> I, I was talking on resource and, resources and funding. Yes. Were, were you still hearing yes. me there? Yes, you, you we were. Yeah. I went on to the next slide. Uh, were yes. you still with me on this one? Okay, where I was now, COVID, uh, WHO Gavi COVID facility, we have the 1.2 million worth of doses. We have also signed with the Africa Union facility. And as I mentioned, we have the private sector really contributing. I know there were discussions, negotiations with the treasury who are really leading in this resource mobilization for vaccination, uh, talking even with the uh, uh, medical aids and so on. How can they come on board? What is it that they need to do to make sure that those who get it, get it for free? So if we move on to the target groups for vaccinations, which is another area that people have asked a lot of questions about, we are basically talking of three phases. Phase one is the, uh, the population at the highest risk, and it's in two stages. Stage one, the frontline workers, and then stage two, which are those with chronic illnesses, elderly, you name it. And then stage, stage rather, phase two, lecturers, uh, old school staff population, and so on. And finally, finally, anyone, everybody else uh, is there. So this is basically one thing with clarity in our that the population of 16 children is 41.2%. Quite clearly, if you subtract that from the total population, our numbers, the percentages that we have to cover suddenly are different from what you're seeing, what they are saying in Europe, in America, because the uh, demography is very different. We have a younger population, more children, and we're not targeting those um, under age for this vaccination. And so hence our population, uh, our, our vaccination percentage comes around the 60% we're talking about very much guided by global science, by science on the ground. And so if we now now look at the actual rollout delivery, other things in Zimbabwe, where you, how are you going to be able to move the vaccines to all the provinces? We did it with a bang in almost a day or two because we already have structures in place. The provinces that I've talked about earlier have these trucks that are doing this work every single day. It is not new. Hello. Uh, not again. You are still audible. Oh, okay. I thought I was kind of again. Okay, all right, let me finish. Uh, and so the rollout was on the 18th, you were all there. Uh, VP actually, um, static facilities, the outreach teams have sort of been uh, withheld a bit, but we again are discussing that to see with our numbers that are slightly a bit um, on the low side, how can we bump up and make sure that we do vaccinate uh, the percentages we want to make sure that we are ready and prepared for any potential third wave, as I pointed out earlier on. So the other area that people really always want to know about that, that is also creating a bit of fear, hesitancy, vaccine safety monitoring, managing of those adverse events following immunization uh, and the injection safety. Of course, in partnership with uh, the, the, the unit that I've just talked about in the Ministry of Health and Child Care, there's the national, what you call the National Pharmacovigilance and Clinical Trials Committee, Medicines Control Authority of Zimbabwe, MCAS. These are the main drivers of the vaccine safety and uh, surveillance. This is why MCAS, Medicines Control Authority of Zimbabwe, uh, at the forefront, before we even import the vaccine, they will have checked the science, the paperwork, and so on to make sure that once we start vaccinating, we're not worried about the vaccine, we're not safe. 
we're now looking at what other issues, side effects, the usual side effects that might come up and how we can manage them. So COVID-19 vaccine safety surveillance is being guided by already existing ministries adverse event structures following the immunization surveillance guidelines that we already we have always had. And the WHO COVID-19 vaccine safety surveillance manual. WHO came up with that and we've read it from, from page to page several times, making sure that that global guidance science is speaking well on our local science and we're with confidence. So this is a bit of detail on that uh, vaccine safety monitoring management of adverse events following immunization. That's the AEFI -A -A uh, in injection safety. Uh, we'll be second. We are already doing that training. Remember, I said our teams are already trained for vaccination because they're already doing vaccinations. However, there are specific, unique things to COVID 19 vaccines. These are new. So, we've done all the trainings in terms of uh, training of the, the committee itself, um, uh, training, prepared pre preparation for the healthcare workers uh, to, for them to be able to identify and manage uh, cases, whether it's those severe, severe, which can come, the anaphylactic shocks that we talk about. Remember, any vaccine, even paracetamol, one can react. And hence, you can actually, that. that is no reason for one to stop from getting the vaccine, for everybody else to stop, rather. Uh, we are aware you can, if some people don't take peanuts, they eat peanuts, they can even convulse and go on to die. That's a reaction. So it's really being trained to make sure that they appreciate that even more when at the end of the first wave. However, there's need to remain vigilant. Avoid, remember that complacency arrow that I put between the first wave and the second wave. If we do what we did at the end of the first wave, I there is no two way about two ways about it. We will find ourselves in a third and potentially even bigger uh, uh, a wave because this vaccine, or rather, this virus is very clever. It mutates. It says, huh, you got me in the first wave. Not to worry. I've changed. I will attack you in a different way. And we will not be ready. That's exactly what happened with the second wave. We not only uh, became complacent, but we actually also got hit by the South African variant. When we are, our scientists then did the genotyping and so on uh, in February, they actually found that we had about 61% and beyond. And in fact, in December, towards the end of December, January, it was actually of about 90% of the variant was the South African type. And it explains how it spread so quickly, transmissibility was so high and so on. So we are saying once again, please, let's not be complacent and think, oh, nothing can, surely we can't get anything bigger than what we already have. It can happen if we're complacent, if we don't pay attention. We must continue with the two prevention front measures that I talked about, just summarizing it, the public health and social measures, public health, EHSM, which includes as surveillance, doing surveillance, Wait, testing, uh, making uh, sure uh, cases uh, are managed appropriately, uh, uh, paying attention to our uh, post of uh, entry. And yes, the social measures for you and I in the public, the social distancing of what Yes, yes it's a little bit of uh, lockdown, but you, you still really should not be going into those gatherings uh, if you can avoid it. If you can, it doesn't mean because we have relaxed, oh, yes, let's go partying, let's have the Guinea style funerals. No, we really must pay attention. Finally, finally, the vaccine you really wanted to talk about here which is our second prevention front, uh, we have got to pay attention. Let's va get vaccinated. Uh, we saw a number starting slow. They're picking up, hitches here and there. That is the nature of any new program. We will never expect it to be 100% but we're making such fantastic progress. A lot of people from the region have actually called me asking me, how have you managed Zimbabwe? Initially, we thought you were way behind in terms of vaccination.
because there was so much misinformation about Zimbabwe is not wanting to bring the vaccines. Uh, Zimbabwe doesn't have a plan. Uh, how can we even talk about it? The fact that you don't have information on a certain issue does not mean the information is not there. Uh, inform each other, help each other spread the correct information to give confidence to our population. If we continue working together, I have every confidence we have this under control. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahomva. That was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, it shows that you have actually done this um, <laughs> quite remarkably so many times, and I'm getting comments here on how articulate this presentation has been. And um, thank you very much. And I'm quite sure that you will continue to still be hooked on or, uh, so that we, you follow the rest of the conversation. And perhaps at the end of our um, webinar, towards the end, you can engage uh, um, and respond to some of the questions that come through. Uh, just some housekeeping issues. Uh, if you're not presenting, please, can you mute your mic? And uh, secondly, if you've got any burning questions as the presentations are going through, please do not hesitate to use the chat box at the bottom. We will take note of your questions and uh, we will direct them to those uh, of the panelists that uh, uh, will be um, in a position to answer them. At this point in time, we'd like to invite Dr. Eva Charasika to, that's Farai Charasika, to join us. He also has a presentation, and I would like to ask Tino um, to uh, ensure that he has got the presentation rights for us. Hi, Farai, how are you doing? I'm good, thank yes, you. How are just you? as a formal introduction, Dr. Farai Charasika is a public health practitioner. Is a clinical mentor and a medical doctor who has worked with public, private, and civil society institutions across the globe. Dr. Farai Charasika, the floor is yours. All right, no, thank you very much. Uh, please confirm you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. You can proceed. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to uh, have a conversation with you all. And uh, also thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Mahomba for a good and uh, comprehensive uh, and uh, how strategic we are being. So thank you, Dr. Mahomba, for that presentation. Um, so I'm going to uh, do a bit of a deep dive around the vaccines. I think Dr. Mahomba gave us the context of where we're coming from from uh, and our plans as a country and be done to put our seats and lately and then putting some genetic material from the and then they are vaccinated uh, from uh, proteins that surround the, the virus. So in terms of COVID, there are some proteins that surround the genetic material. We take some of those proteins and then introduce them to the body. So we'll talk a little bit about each of those types of vaccines and how they work um, and key considerations for us uh, here in Zimbabwe. But basically those are the four categories. And just to kind of uh, let you know that globally, across the globe, there are at least 48 vaccines which are either on the pathway to being approved or some have been approved, whether it's by WHO or the FDA or the various uh, regional uh, bodies that accredit uh, and validate vaccines. So there's about 48 in the pipeline, uh, uh, but all at different stages. Some have finished clinical trials and fully approved, and those are the names that you commonly hear. And we'll look at those, and then there are others which are still down the road coming. So big number of uh, options in terms of uh, vaccines and which ones make the most sense. And each country must decide what makes sense for it from a cost per cloud and logistics perspective, 
um, and in terms of the science that they are looking at. But they all have different cons, and we'll, we'll look at all these various vaccines. So just remember this slide, and we'll come back to some of this information in detail. So again, um, just so we can have uh, some information. So I think the big names that we first heard were Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine, which is the very first column. I think that's the one that we heard uh, that came out first, and everyone was excited about there's now a vaccine. Um, and a little bit quieter was the Moderna, which came alongside with that. And the other big name which we're hearing was the AstraZeneca, uh, Oxford, um, and that came out as well. And then we also had the Gamaliya uh, scenes. And of course, I've included here Sinopharm because that's what we are at present using uh, through the different mechanisms, the COVAX and the uh, African Union we will probably get a few uh, options. We also know that the Indian option uh, will be coming through uh, into Zimbabwe. Um, but these are the various vaccines, at least, that are in play, uh, with Sinopharm also being the one that we have started with here in Zimbabwe. So there are different uh, efficacy rates. And efficacy rates uh, basically means how effective it is uh, in preventing uh, a serious case of COVID. Um, so if we look at Sinopharm, which we'll uh, focus on a little bit, 86% uh, effective. So that's very good. Uh, there are trials. Every time you do a new vaccine or a new drug, you go through uh, trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, where you're looking to learn different things at each phase. And basically, once you have completed phase three trials and you've got collected all the data in terms of what's working and what's not working in terms of side effects, uh, you can then go for approval. So uh, phase three is a critical stage uh, for a vaccine to go through. And yes, the vaccines have been developed quite fast in a space of 12 months, um, but uh, we're able to go through all the three phases and be able to determine the data. Um, and so that's how we get the efficacy, the effectiveness of, of the vaccine and how important it is. Uh, if we go to the section, just a uh, second from the bottom, uh, where it says cold chain, that's a very, very, very important section for countries to consider. So the Pfizer that came out first, everyone was excited about that, but that Pfizer needed to be transported at minus 70 degrees Celsius. So you'd need liquid nitrogen uh, and carbon monoxide and uh, frozen carbon dioxide to be able to transport that, which can be quite complicated and difficult for developing countries. Um, because the supply chain becomes quite complex. So we heard, you know, Dr. Mahom tell us that when the vaccines arrived in Zimbabwe, we were able to deploy them uh, across the country within a couple of days, within two or three days. And that's because the, the Sinopharm, which we are using, um, has got a simple uh, refrigeration uh, temperature and, and process, which is similar to all the other vaccines that we already use, our measles, mumps, rubella, our polio, our TB. Um, it, uses, it can use the same supply chain. If we had gone for Pfizer, it means we had to set up uh, additional supply chain mechanisms, uh, which are quite costly and expensive for us. And similarly with the Moderna, uh, down to minus 20 degrees Celsius, you can then take them out and put them in your fridges and store them for two to eight degrees after you've stored them for a while. But just setting up that system would be quite complicated for us as a country. And, you know, think about some of our rural areas where the power is not yet fully there. Uh, the refrigerators, you know, we've got refrigerators, but they can only really do the, uh, you know, zero to, to, to 10 degrees Celsius. They can't go lower than that. And there's no power to power deep freezers. So we really need to think about all that. And so that's one of the key considerations that a country has to think about as they roll out vaccines. So looking at Sinopharm again, uh, and right at the end on the extreme right. So you know, we can store it for between two to eight degrees Celsius for up to 30 days. So that works for us as a country. 
Um, and any vaccines that we will probably bring in will probably need to be in that uh, range as well so that we can get them out to our, our rural health centers and our health facilities. The trucks that we use uh, as a country, the refrigerators all uh, are operational in that temperature range. So any vaccines that we, even when we get other vaccines besides Sinopharm Farm as a country, we'll need to consider that temperature maintenance. What happens is if the temperature goes higher, basically your vaccine uh, is destroyed and becomes ineffective. So we must maintain uh, those temperatures. So very quickly, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we've talked about this, but basically looking at the different uh, vaccines, it's basically telling you the name of the company, the type. So remember, we talked about there are four types of vaccines and then how many doses you're supposed to get. And uh, the number in brackets is how many days in between. So as of now in Zimbabwe, we're using the Sinopharm, so row number two. So let's look at that. So it is an inactivated virus. That means it's a virus that's uh, been uh, killed and made inactive. We need two doses, and those are done 21 days apart. And uh, it's done through IM. So IM means intramuscular so it's an injection into your muscle and that's typically just on your shoulder um the same way you'd get your tb jab so really that's where the vaccine we are currently using so as other vaccines come in for use in zimbabwe you can look at this chart and that's what will guide us in terms of what needs to happen and what kind of vaccine it is so I won't spend time on this. This is a little bit technical, uh, but again, still really telling us the same kind of thing and how the different viruses, uh, where each type of uh, vaccine sits. So a little bit about the types of viruses. I think this is important, types of vaccines, my apologies, this is important. So inactivated virus, uh, and that's what we'll be using. That's what we're using with, uh, with the Sinopharm. So we basically get samples of the virus and what the, Ch the, the Chinese lab did is they got uh, vi different vi uh, viruses. They use three different types, and then basically they kill them with a chemical. Um, so the virus is dead. Uh, it cannot replicate, and it can be stored at room temperature, or like we said before, between two to eight degrees. Now, what this does is that once that virus has been killed, it cannot multiply anymore, but it still exhibits and shows the properties of the virus. And the way that vaccines work, all the vaccines that we get, the BCGs, the MMRs, the polios, measles, all those things. The way that they work is that you're introducing just a tiny little amount of the infectious agent, whether it's dead or weakened, so that your body learns and understands how to attack that, uh, that disease. So your body then generates memory, it generates new cells, it generates uh, an immune response that says when this kind of disease comes into the body, this is how we will react. And so that's how a vaccine works. Basically, you're introducing a piece of protein, a piece of virus, a piece of DNA that looks like the disease. And then your body is then able to learn and understand it and then develop the cells or, you know, in the old days, you say develop my soldier the soldiers in your body learn and know how to attack when this kind of enemy comes in. And then from there on, if you ever get that infection, your body mounts a response immediately because now it has got memory on how to deal with this, um, with this uh, infection. So really that's how, that's how, that's how uh, vaccinations, immunizations work. So is it inactivated viruses? There is live attenuated or weakened viruses. So these are uh, viruses where it's not completely killed, but it's made much weaker. Uh, and it generally only needs one dose and it, it uh, generates long lasting immunity. So here, the immunity is a little bit longer than normal uh, because you've got a live virus. And so your body uh, is able to detect that. And so it mounts a robust immune response, almost like it's dealing with a live infection. So that's, that's important. Um, as of now, we don't have any of these vaccines in Zimbabwe. They may come, depending on what we end up procuring as a nation. Uh, then we have what are called viral vector vaccines. And this is a new kind of technology uh, which just emerged. 
uh, basically you're taking the the genes or the genetic code uh, from one virus and you're putting it into a harmless virus. So in, in the case of COVID, you'd be taking, for example, the COVID genetic material and you put it into a harmless virus, like for example, the common flu virus uh, that we have, everyone has flus in June, July, we have flus, it's harmless, you have your flu, you sniff and you get on with life. So you take some of that virus, you put some of the COVID and so what you're doing is you're introducing and allowing the body to be able to identify what COVID would look like if it was to attack the body. Caveat with this is that it cannot be used in uh, immunosuppressed or immunocompromised people. But this is a new technology that is still being used. And again, as of now, we don't yet have this in Zimbabwe. Then finally, we have the DNA and RNA vaccines. And basically what these are doing is you're getting a bit of the, uh, the genetic code. for and then basically the body then responds very quickly. These are much cheaper, cheaper and easier to mass produce. Uh, they do produce uh, strong reactions. So why do we give two doses? I think in the one of the earlier uh, slides I showed us where we said we do two doses. Um, why do we do that? What we basically want to do is we wanting to boost the body's uh, ability to respond. So we give the vaccine the first dose. And so your body has what we call the primary immune response, that first rise in the graph. But what tends to happen is after a bit of time, your body maybe doesn't mount enough cells or it only mounts a few cells. And so that immunity starts to go down. So what you do is you bring in a second dose and what you do is you're strengthening, you're reminding the body, look, this is how you're gonna deal with this. Um, and so again, when you strengthen that, basically you get a secondary immune response. And so what happens is that your resting state, you now have a stronger immune memory. And so that we do it with vaccine. So, that, so here, that's why we get two doses. If you remember your TB or these BCG vaccines, you'd get one when you're a baby, you'd get one when you were in uh, grade one or fresh. And then before we used to get one when you're in grade seven. So you get three. If you're older and you look on your right shoulder, you will probably see three uh, scars on, on your on right shoulder. And that was because what we wanted to do was to keep reminding the body of how to deal with this infection when it comes. So that's what we do when we're doing vaccines. So with COVID, we're doing two vaccines for most of the uh, two doses for most of the vaccines. And the idea there is to remind the body in a short space of time, this is what the enemy looks like and this is what you need to deal with. And so you get that higher level um, of immune memory cells, which is what we're looking to do. So again, this is a little bit clinical and I think Dr. Mahomes has already spoken about this. So I'm not really going to talk too much about this. Uh, this is really talking about stages of vaccines when we launch uh, so stage one, we're really looking at our health workers and our frontline workers, and I believe also many of the journalists have been included in our phase one, stage one. Uh, stage two, we're then looking at uh, our other adults and other people who could be at a higher risk. So a risk because of underlying conditions or risk because of uh, engaging uh, with large populations. So for example, our teachers. Our teachers are engaging with classrooms of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 children um, who could be carriers of it. So our teachers are uh, probably likely in, in phase two. Um, any other health care would be left behind and they're all really involved. Stage three, for us to reach 60%, again, as Dr. Mahomba has shown us, we basically need to, uh, we need to uh, immunize our whole adult population, everyone over the age of 16. So basically phase three would basically look at everyone else. Um, who needs to be vaccinated for us to reach that 60%. And that's for us to achieve a concrete herd immunity. Herd immunity basically means that uh, when a large enough number of the population has been vaccinated, even if one or two individuals get an infection, uh, it will not multiply because the herd is immune. So the herd just means the group of people is immune. So even if a few people get infected, it will not multiply and escalate because the rest of the people uh, 
are immunized and it, it, it won't catch on. Or if it catches on, it's going to be very mild. So once someone gets vaccinated, what are going to be some of the signs and symptoms? So the person might get a very mild flu, you know, just a runny nose, maybe some teary eyes, um, but that's about it. Might get a moderate temperature increase. Remember, with the vaccines, we're introducing a foreign body. So your body will respond a little bit in terms of, uh, hey, what's this? Something in the body that's new to us. Let's all see what's happening. These are the soldier cells which are talking. Uh, let's go ahead and understand it. So when that happens, there's a little bit of a temperature. But remember that what's been introduced is either dead or weakened, or it's just a protein, or it's just an RNA. The body will mount a response, and that causes your temperature to rise a little bit. Um, but that very quickly comes down the next day or two. And then there may be mild muscular pain, especially where you are injected. Um, obviously, a needle has gone into there, and then the vaccine itself comes in a fluid media. And so sometimes, you know, that's introduced into our muscles, may cause a little bit of pain and discomfort. But again, very quickly, that will go down. Uh, so most, 95% of people will not have any major reactions, and basically they'll just have these mild signs and symptoms, and many people might not even have anything, will not experience anything, just from colleagues, uh, you know, uh, you know, when we've been monitoring the, the, the vaccinations, and basically the feedback is most people are not having any major events. Now, Dr. Mahom all talked about monitoring for major adverse events, so that's also very important, and we are doing that as a country. Um, as we are vaccinated, there is a possibility that someone, that one individual, may react severely. For an, and so we need to be able to document that, understand why that person reacted severely, so that at least if there's specific things, they can be investigated a little bit more. And if it's a type of condition or disease, we prevent uh, or we adjust how we administer vaccines to that population with that kind of issue or disease. So that's why we have that adverse event monitoring team that's really looking at everyone who's been vaccinated. But I'm happy to say that we have not had very many major uh, um, adverse events, and the, we continue to track all people who've been vaccinated in Zimbabwe. So with that, that's the end of my slide. I'll hand back over to the moderators. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Farai for that uh, very comprehensive presentation, um, looking at uh, the nitty gritties about the vaccine and how it, it works in our bodies. Um, I note that there are quite a number of questions that are coming through. Uh, um, continue to write questions on the chat box and we will uh, be able to have them uh, dealt with when the presentations have been done. Next in line, is going to be Dr. B. Admitted, don't worry. Oh, yeah. Like we've been from the presentations that were before us. For us to achieve yet immunity, we want to have a certain number of the population being vaccinated. And if a significant chunk of the population chooses not to get vaccinated, it means we are exposing ourselves and it means the consequences are far reaching. It ceases to be a personal thing that I don't want to be vaccinated because we are dealing with a contagious disease. So it ceases. Um, I mean, we, we all know what we, uh, we, we, we all know the implication of one person getting sick. It's not only you, you're exposing other people. You're, even the national resources, we are using national resources for you to get treated when you get, go to the hospital. So it ceases to be something, it ceases to be my life, my choice. When you are exposing, when you are going to use 
resources for everyone, which, re which resource, I mean, the resources which could be channeled to other things be because of poor choices which people are making. When it comes to lifestyle, the things that we can do um, to improve and boost our immunity. Okay, someone says, I still don't want to get vaccinated. What can I do to boost my immunity? It's okay, there are things that we can look at, like uh, nutrition, exercise, stress management. I'll start by talking about the issues of, um, maybe if I can just give a rundown of the things that can help us in, in terms of our immune system. We, we had a presentation on vaccination, which we just heard from Dr. Charasika explaining the issues of memory uh, immunity, creating memory immunity. When we are boosting our immune system with, with diet, with exercise, uh, with stress management, we are not creating any memory immunity. What we are doing, maybe we are getting ready our immunity to fight, but not uh, supplements. You may get selenium supplements, or if you can't get those, we have things like um, different types of seeds that are high in these, your pumpkin seeds, your sesame seeds, different type of seeds, different types of nuts, um, cashew nuts that can help to boost your zinc levels. We are also looking at um, uh, boosting your B complex, your vitamin B complex, so which you you get from your unrefined, unprocessed grains. Mainly our traditional small grains will get will give you your B complex, your quinoa seeds, your um, yes, most of these unprocessed small grains. But the challenge which we mainly face when we are talking about life is not every every day that a person is still at high levels or for example, when you are taking a soft drink, let me talk about taking a soft drink. You, you may take a, take a soft drink, uh, a 300 bottle and 30 can, you can you, uh, reducing your immune system by about 60% for five hours, which becomes a challenge because you do not know when this virus is going to attack you. So if in your diet and nutrition or lifestyle practices, Illness is the right to access basic health care and service for illness. That is not happening. And um, people start to wonder uh, uh, when the government or those, those in authority are saying if we are giving you a vaccine, of which the people, the majority, uh, a citizen, doesn't have the information on the on the issues like uh, the advantages of the given vaccine. Uh, do we have enough information on the vaccine, the sign of a vaccine which is, uh, the, uh, which is being used now? Uh, do we have a choice of the vaccines? Those, where can we are able to choose how many vaccines are using uh, currently in Zimbabwe? And are we having a choice, or we are just being told that we use this one, this vaccine, we use this vaccine? Uh, the issue of vaccine is uh, the issue of uh, do we have a choice in the given 
it gets head on immune. The third thing, yeah, the fourth thing I think should be also addressed is the we are seeing people, the people, ordinary people, have ignored these all these measures. The announcements or the relaxing, a relaxing of uh, the lockdown. What is the government doing? I will not be seen again going or having serious uh, in the coming future. Uh, that uh, is my presentation or um, uh, some of the questions. Uh, thank you. Um, quite comprehensive. Um, some of the concerns, the burning concerns, really are fire. Um, uh, the 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 officials look into. Um, to declare here and now that I'm part of the rapid uh, communication and community engagement committee and. The issues that you are raising have a lot to do with education. I have also forwarded them to the team, especially when it comes to education on the vaccines, in that they are not adequately communicated to the public at large. And that, you know, issues that by Dr. and also Dr. Charaka are things that need to be shared in greater part. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we are hoping that in the next coming session, the, the, the participants, the, the facilitators are going to address those. Um, we've got two, three very interesting questions for the panelists to look at. Uh, Dr. Mahova, I'm sure you're still with us. Uh, yes, I want to start with the community. Because the reason why we're all here is about our community, individual. It's not about government structures. So on. Yes. And first, to appreciate and thank the presenter uh, for really uh, uh, complimenting me on my presentation. Uh, I, I was sort of smiling when he was telling me, what did you say? This fruit is called what? And, uh, <laughs> it's looking very pretty outside, but maybe it's rotted inside. <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it, but I, I still want to thank him for acknowledging uh, the hard work that we're all doing. But if I start with the, the question, he says, what is government doing? This is one question I continuously get and I'm and continuously concerned uh, because while government puts in place standard operating procedure guidelines, the, the so-called presentation I gave you is the work of the government to put in place structures, you name it, things then work. The implementation on the ground is you and I, the employee of the Minister of Health, it's an individual, yourself in the community, need to do something. We have put in the policy, the structures, the, uh, the strategies, you name it, to guide you implement. So when we say government, what is government doing? This is what government has done. The next issue we would like to see, and remember I talked about complacency coming from you, the community. We are saying, let's not be complacent. We are saying, can communities take ownership and drive it? Don't just sit to wait for government to drive it. We want you to drive it. So that ownership is critical. And I'm basically throwing it back to you to say what you say is, it is what government is doing. What is now left is for you to take it on and take ownership. Efforts from government to give information. I think uh, uh, Mr. Moderator spoke to that. Will there be a time uh, come to uh, prevent people from uh, riding Zuko and so on? I think once again, when I talked, I said we have challenges here and there. We, we never run away from our challenges. We never, ever run away from our challenges. Indeed, 
trying to push people to get them to volunteer a difficult task indeed quite clearly when it comes to say if you don't have a, if you're vaccinated can you ride zuko or not i think those are discussions that are still going on and it is this input that actually helps us shape our strategies and approaches to say oh we don't think this is good for the community and we discuss it in our meetings and we recommend the right approaches that actually help you we are helping you it's not about putting sops just for the fun of it was well, sinopharm clinically tested in zimbabwe i think uh, perhaps when uh, Dr. Charasika was presenting, he talked of clinical trials. These are the things that happen when you are developing the vaccine. These clinical trials are not so if you get a paracetamol tablet, for example, one would say, so was paracetamol, did we do clinical trials for paracetamol? No, we did not. The clinical trials were done by the manufacturer of the drug, and then we look at the science of it. There are scientists who say, is it solid? Is it what have you? That's what our medicines control authority does. If we were to do a clinical trial for every single drug, uh, your amoxil, antibiotic, anti-malaria, your what have you, we will basically be doing clinical trials and not uh, addressing you. But we look at the signs from the clinical trials done by the manufacturer of the drug. Sign of disadvantages, what is government doing to counter misinformation? I think you're absolutely what we're doing here today is part of that. We sincerely hope those who are in communication then help us spread the information. Our business, when I'm sitting where I'm sitting, is to really make sure that the standard operating procedures, guidelines, approaches, you name it, it's in place. How are we guiding people? How are we coordinating? Then we have different units that people, their own area, remember the whole of government that I talked about. Social media, you can't ignore it. You are absolutely right. And we have no intention of ignoring social media. What we are concerned about is when social media spreads misinformation, when social media tells people, don't take because it hasn't been tested, when in fact they don't have the information. There was one that was circulating to say WHO has approached Zimbabwe saying Zimbabwe is using Sinopharm, which hasn't been tested. I took it upon myself as, as part of my job to phone WHO to say, is, is this your statement? Was it that you want to do? They disowned that immediately. That's circulating in social, on social media, misinformation. And this is what we are saying. We have no intention of ignoring social media, but we are saying, can social media also be responsible? Make sure they are passing the right information and not misinformation. That's very clear. Is government spreading COVID-19 um, information? Uh, uh, ordinary people, uh, I, I'm not sure if I understand that question. Do we have a choice? Absolutely. You do have a, a, a sorry, so these are actually some of the questions that were coming from uh, the, the chat. Do we have a choice? You do have a choice. But remember, if you choose to take Pfizer, which has not been cleared by Medicines Control Authority, how are you going to take it if it's out in, in UK only? It hasn't gone through the local science that we're talking about. But remember, government is a responsibility to safeguard the, the health of the nation in general, not just one particular individual. But you, you will be happy to know that the Medicines Control Authority does actually sanction and, uh, and and allow, give authority to certain individual drugs that might not have been approved for the general use and so on. But the process is the same. The science has got to be looked at. Has this drug gone through the clinical trials that it's supposed to have, it has supposed to have gone which was manufactured, all that. They do that. I remember at one time people were talking ivermectin. How dare government not allowing people to use ivermectin? And eventually they say, oh, yes, it has been uh, authorized. No, it has not been authorized as such. People were using dog ivermectin. Ivermectin for dogs. That's not what government is there to approve such things. We would approve medicines for human beings that would have gone through clinical trials for use in human beings. And so when people want to use ivermectin, for example, the, the human kind one, it must be imported, the science must be there, and this is what Medicine Control Authority was talking about, authorizing to say, let us see the human type, where the data, where the clinical trends, where's the documentation, and then doctors, uh, the, the real experts, not some who then pretend to be experts, 
know very clearly they can use any drug as long as it comes through the right ways. It has been checked by Medicines Control Authority, given approval. Uh, government giving vaccine yet majority have no information on uh, other things. I, I think really government, the, just like we're seeing vaccinations a bit slow with the healthcare workers, we're making decisions to say, so should we just on until every single healthcare worker has been vaccinated? Uh, shouldn't we just be moving and giving those who volunteer and so on? So it's not always about if we can't treat your high blood pressure, therefore let's stop until we get that perfect before we introduce something to treat COVID-19. That would be very unfortunate. We keep moving with everything else while we are and acknowledge that we still have challenges in high blood pressure, diabetes, you name it. In fact, our experts advisory committee uh, did a survey in December when we were concerned about that very question that the presenter gave us, that other uh, essential health services were perhaps being compromised. We did that. We've since shared with the Ministry of Health. We're actually helping them. That we strengthen how those other services continue to be provided, whether it's your high blood pressure, Diabetes and so work on that, but we're not going to that's up today. We're not going to say, ah, we we are still struggling with managing high blood pressure. So let's therefore hold this one for now while we try and make sure the uh, high blood pressure is managed. Not at all. That is not public health. Public health includes attacking everything that comes our way, strengthening what is weak, acknowledging our challenges and putting in place strategies, working with you, of course, the community. Once again, it's because we're, we're doing this for you, not just for the for the sake of it. The next question was the health on um, uh, it's, it's the right of everybody. I think that's what I was actually trying to address now, that it is your health, it is your right. Uh, government puts in place the, the, the uh, enabling environment, all make it up and make sure we're doing our part. Nice looking presentation. I think I already... Uh, thank you for uh, appreciating my presentation. But you're absolutely right. In in that fruit that is looking pretty, there's still a, a few rotten apples. Some of the apples are our communities being complacent. So you you name it. But of course, we never run away from the fact that government still has a lot to do. But let's always pay to what we can do uh, and do it, and not to maybe just get too lost with the challenges. They they are there to be addressed absolutely. Uh, what does it take to improve our capacity in preparing for future pandemics? This is exactly what we're doing. This uh, a question from, from the, the, the child. This is exactly about our vaccine. Told at the very end, evaluation of the whole process. I did say at the end, we want to know so that we're ready for the next uh, pandemic uh, epidemic. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Mahomba. That was very comprehensive. Uh, you know, I was looking at my list of questions and you were ticking them. You were ticking all of them. Um, you've done such a splendid job for us. Uh, and I'm sure that um, those who are participating here really did um, um, benefit from your presence in this webinar. And I'm quite sure that uh, in the near future, you know, when we are looking back at the process itself and how far it has gone, we are going to call on you once again to come and brief us on what is actually taking place. We would also like to extend our th hearty thanks to you and the other panelists, uh, Dr. Mbiriri, Dr. Charastika, and um, Marco, for also, you know, for making this uh, presentation, this webinar, such a very informative one coming through and I'm quite sure that uh, we can uh, channel them to you directly and uh, you can answer them for in fact this one this one last one from uh, Zora uh, maybe you could um, you know work on that one it says that Sinopharm work against the South African variant the virus is mutating will people need to be vaccinated I knew I think this is very critical it requires your answer yeah, yeah. Uh, th that's fine. I think that question is everybody's question, really. This is one of the reasons why. And in fact, there was, there was one I actually forgot to, to I didn't quite respond comprehensively, where the capacity for us 
are we building the capacity? We are in terms of also doing genotyping to make sure we are clear in terms of what genotype we have here. We have since uh, we around that we did, we got support from a UK university and we managed to see what variant there was uh, with the first wave and so on. We did the second wave and we've since received the equipment for us to do the genotyping ourselves. Uh, lab scientists are being trained uh, and, and we are very confident that moving forward we will be able to do that. That will also help us then appreciate whether the Sinopharm is actually uh, doing justice to the new variants that, that might come up. But I might bring you back to the science that uh, Dr. Charasika uh, uh, gave us where he was talking of the type of uh, uh, viruses and so on. A, a lot of respond to that, that attacks the, any, any variant that might have come uh, uh, better than those vaccines that only target specific spikes uh, because it is those spikes that are actually instrumental in the mutation and, and coming up with new variants. So the idea of using a whole virus, uh, killed virus to uh, mount a response is actually uh, viewed to be more superior and hence better able possibly uh, to attack any additional variants than a vaccine that simply targets specific spikes and it is those spikes that mutate and when you have new ones able to. But that's also work in progress because remember this, this is all new. But the good thing is even if when you are vaccinated we're saying uh, we're trying to protect you from this, uh, not getting it, but if you do get it, um, it will be mild. And of course, it means also you might not get the very severe issue of are you actually going on to die. So really, really, it's important that you get vaccinated. Don't worry too much about uh, this vi variant. If it's not going to do any good to me, uh, really, you are better off the killed virus than a live mm. deadly virus attacking you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. We've uh, run out of time. And uh, fantastic. Um, I'm sure the participants enjoyed this. And um, I'm left to thank the participants for, you know, for being there for the whole two hours and uh, for this for a splendid, splendid webinar. And I'm quite sure that we will organize another one along similar lines. We thank the Media Center for having organized this. From me, Lennox and Klanger, It's a great day to everyone of you. We meet again. Bye. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Good. Thank, Thank you to you, everyone, for the participation. Thank you. Okay.